Well, welcome everybody to Resilient Faith. I am Trish Jenkins and I have a wonderful guest with me today. Today's program, you may be watching it or you may be listening on audio to the podcast, but we are about finding interesting people who can talk about building resilient faith through uh, leadership, through whatever it is in your life, your life, your relationships, your re re relationship with yourself to build that resilient faith because, you know, life isn't always easy. Life is life. So, uh, you know, what did some, I heard someone, heard someone say, life isn't fair. Fair is what you pay to ride the bus. <laughs> but we should, we should be fair. But building resilience is how we sustain our faith, our relationship with God. So I'm, I've got some guests coming on, and particularly today I've got um, Pastor Paul Smith, Skip Smith, and uh, he has a journey. And uh, the privilege I have is to, to ask some of the harder questions. Rather than having a preach, it's actually having a behind-the-scenes chat. So welcome aboard, Pastor Skip. Hey, thanks, Trish. Well, great to hear to be here today. And you know what? Uh, to, for your listeners and viewers, we've been friends for a long time. I was just going through our photos the other day looking for something, and I came across your wedding photos. We were at your wedding for you and Justin, and we're just oh, going, oh, yes, Trish and Justin's wedding. So <laughs> we have known you for quite a few years, and obviously, and we were at your wedding. And uh, look, it's great to be here with you today. And it's great to um, done life with you, in, you know, and where our lives have intersected at times, and uh, to, to come back together and chat with you today is a, a great joy. Oh, so fabulous. Now, because yeah, I, I remember, yes, I, I remember when you came to church at uh, COC there in Brisbane, and we were both um, young adults, and yep. so, yeah, that was, that was a while ago. We don't need to count exactly how long, <laughs> um, but I have loved uh your ministry. It, it's like you're the guy who, there's nothing you can't do. You, Look, he preaches, he sings, he dances, he, he, he's great with kids and, and he's actually got a fabulous business background, which we will touch on as well. Uh, so the journey that you've had, and more so um, in the last 10 years or so, where you were pastoring a large church and now you've shifted over to um, doing uh, Alpha, which is great. So, but tell me about... Uh, that, that bit of background that, that you gave us um, about that and um, what life was like, your, the, the responsibilities and so on that required resilience. Yeah, sure. So uh, when you're pastoring a church, it's so different to be part of a church. And ah. uh, I remember being, we were on staff at, uh, at a church, at City Point Church for many years. And so being part of the staff and you think, you know, you've got a team of this big and, you know, we had a team of 150, 200 people um, oh, just in our worship team that we had together. And you've, so you've got even your creative team. So you've got, and you think, wow, I must know what it's like. So people in the church of 100 people, um, I'll know that, you know, it's the same thing. So when we went to actually took over a church in Sydney of, of a church of about 100, 150 people, it was it was like chalk and cheese. It's like nothing I'm prepared for. The weight of responsibility when the buck stops with you is so different to working part of a team. Not diminishing people who work as part of a team and on staff and, and, and with teams, but when buck stops with you, there's a there's this weight that is you can't describe. You can only experience. And so we went to Sydney for three years, planted a church, took over a church at the same time and just really found out what it was like to, to do that because in our world you don't have the underwriting of uh of the of a denomination behind you even though you're part of the denomination the way it's set up is that if you can't pay your bills you can't pay your bills so you don't eat that week you know so that's how it's set up so you learn very quickly that you've got to get enough money to come in every single week to pay those bills or you need to go get another job uh, and so finding that out it was a real learning phase. And then, you know, we came back on st um, staff at the church for a while. And then we went and took over a, a church after Pastor Clark Taylor invited us to come over to Worship Centre. And we were there for a number of years. You know, we went over the church, 1,000 people. You've got a, a church that's uh, big, it's the, the bigger budget. You've got staff. 
half an hour, uh, whereas before in Sydney it was you know a small district, you don't have to have ten times the size. You've got you, you know, and so the weight of responsibility that comes again. It's not just you that don't get paid; your staff don't get paid if the money doesn't come in. And then we also did a building project where we built a thousand seat auditorium, uh, and in that time as well. So you're raising money not just for your tithes and offerings, but you're asking for finance for building funds so that you can build this auditorium. So there's a lot of pressure that comes around that I know for me that was one of my biggest challenges was dealing with the pressure of especially that finance knowing that you've got to believe God every single week for that finance to come in but Skip you you uh you had people there you took that church and you actually grew that church so it, it did actually grow and you did build that I remember I remember and, and the auditorium was amazing um so obviously people were being fed they were, and they believed in the vision. So it wasn't just you um, persuading the people, you know, oh, how can I best persuade them to part with money? It's you were providing value. And yes, you were trusting God because, I mean, gosh, nobody, I, I've not heard anybody teach people how to believe God like Clark Taylor. Uh, maybe there's a few out there, of course, but but it was just to, just to hear him pray and, and call it in and, and, and build in the spirit, which is what he's taught so many of us to do. But you grew that church, so there was fruit there and the people, more people came and it did fill that church. So it wasn't like you, know, you had that pressure, but it was a worthwhile project. It wasn't just mm. a turnover of money for the sake of building something. Sure, so that's absolutely. tied into yeah. your why, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're building for the generations. You know, you're, you're asking people not just to think about the now for, for their convenience and, you know, it's a nicer building now, but it's about what's going to be here for your kids, what's going to be here for your grandkids and casting that vision really for the future. So, yeah, so, so the, you know, that's what you're doing. You're casting vision along those lines. People are, are coming on board, but it's really about uh, you know, getting people to know why we're doing what we're doing because, again, I think that's one of my understandings is that when you know the why behind your what, it gives you purpose and function and you're able to, to, to push through those times because you've got something bigger that you're holding on to. It's that word from God. It's that sense that God's called me to this. And when you've got a real strong sense of calling or that why, then you're able to endure uh, the pressures that you know, with that. Right. And, and, and again, again, like anything, you know. Again, the fruit is there because I'd, I'd visited your church on a number of occasions for different things and, and heard people's testimonies of, of their lives repaired, of the marriages repaired, of the children coming back online, of people. I met one fellow who'd been in prison for, for I, think, I think it was like a couple of decades and was getting his life back on track. So it wasn't just, oh, let's all go to church and sing a few songs and be nice people. There are lives that were changing. And so when you, when you see that, it encourages you and you remember, you know, your why is not just about, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. It's, this is what I'm supposed to do because it has this flow on effect that mm. does make the world a better place. Yeah, and, so, and look, our calling and our why is always a subset of God's big story that he's telling. It's always a subset of what God's doing on the planet. So it's not like, gee, I came up with something new. It's like I get to be a part of what God is doing already right now. And so uh, knowing that what God's saying and what God is doing on the earth and then where you fit into that, is such a powerful, powerful thing. And so that's the thing that you hold on to. That's the thing that carries you through. And that's the thing that, for me, I feel like I had to wrap my identity around, wasn't around what I was doing, but what God had called me to do and God called me to be. So that uh, many years ago, in my early 20s, I read a book called Discover Your Life Goals by Peter Daniels, a Christian businessman. And so back in my 20s, before I'd ever part of the church, uh, it was finding out what God had put me on the planet for. And I, and I boiled it down through prayer and meditation, thinking through it, down to three things. And, and out of those three things, I would constantly revisit those weekly uh, when I was in leadership. I'd, I'd spend time, I'd go to the gym on a Friday, then I'd go to coffee and then I'd have a thinking time with myself. And I'd sit there and I'd rewrite them every single week and I'd evaluate myself. How well am I doing to what God's called me to do? Now, nowhere in that church was anything about being a pastor. Okay. There was nothing, there's nothing in my why that has got anything about the top description in there. It's more deeper things that I could do a number of ways. I could be serving in a number of ways. And, and recently after we left uh, that, um, that season and I'm in a new job now and a new, new world in a sense now, 
I actually looked at whether I went into politics because, and I, I joined a political party, I, I stood for something local, started getting myself in there because I could see how I could serve God and still fulfil my three things that God had put me on the earth for in politics. So the things that God had called me to aren't about a job, they're about who I am and how I affect people wherever I am. Right, okay. So they're more about your values, would you say? Yeah, exactly. The values or the, the big whys of why I'm here. So things to do with relationships and things to do that I, that I'll, I can do in any circumstance. You know what I mean? So again, they're very private, so I don't share them no, no, because true. everyone needs to find their own. But, okay. but those things that why am I here on the planet? Um, why do I exist? What, what has God put me here for? And when you know what they are and you just keep revisiting those, they become that central thing that holds you through the time. I think this is a good time to to bring out the point that, you know, people might be sitting at home or in their car listening to this however they are and thinking, well, what is my purpose? And I don't pastor a big church or I don't, I'm not travelling the world speaking like Trish is or, or whatever. But, but what you're saying is it's not about, your purpose in life is not about the job description of what you do because that, that can even become an idol because it becomes mm -hmm. that's about what I am. But when it's about the values that God has called you to focus on and your identity in him, mm -hmm. your who more than your do, yes. then regardless of what job you have, whether you're at home with children or whether you're teaching school or whether you're wherever you are, we're called to bear that fruit and trust God to lead us in conversations with people where we'll draw them closer to him or where we're going to be helpful to someone to have those values. And then you can express those values in pretty much any venue, any, any role Absolutely. that you get. That's a really good point about our identity is our purpose. Mm. That's rather it. Yeah. Than and you, the actual yeah. job descriptions. Absolutely. And it's so important to be able to spend that time doing it. And the, the younger you can do it, the better. They're the things, those, Three things helped me navigate some of the, the rockiest times of my life, uh, and and they've helped me uh, make big decisions. That because I wasn't there making decisions based upon, I know a whole range of things. Like even the decision to go and pastor this church uh, that that I was at, there was a whole bunch of ramifications that I knew would be uh, ramifications for me in leaving where I was and going to that role, uh, and. You know, I took out my three points and went, okay, what's God called me to? Could doing this do this or could doing this? Because there were other options open to me. I had three or four options open to me at the time of what I could do. And they all, you could you could outwork them in all of those. You know what I'm saying? So but I, my, my question was, where's the place I could best outwork what these three things were? And at the time, that was the why I chose that role. It wasn't because... Better money because it wasn't, it, you know, because it was, you know, better opportunities because, well, what's an opportunity? Opportunities can come from anywhere for anything, you know. So it wasn't about any of those. It was here's the three things God called me to. Where can I best fill that given the options that I've got in front of me? That one. That's I love how it's that. And, and when you do that, you're going to get more job satisfaction in that mm. sense of fulfillment as to what you're doing. You, you kind of, you're, you're in the zone. And it's, it's about that mindset of it aligns with your values so, yes. you, so you can do that. Um, mm. and, and you were at that church for, for quite a while and you grew yeah. it well. Um, yeah. But I, I would like to ask you, what, what was the hardest thing about this? What I'm always mm. curious about because you, you see the success of people, but that doesn't happen automatically. So I would like to know what was mm. the, the hardest thing to deal with or to do or to overcome um, during that time there might be more than one um but and and your your go-to strategies and you've probably covered some of this already but just um yeah. touch on that again yeah so i think one of the hardest things was was the way we it all finished um if i could maybe just start sure. there and then just go around that because it wasn't expected uh, when we left the role, we didn't leave because we go, oh, we've done our job here. We ex I expected being in that place for the rest of my life. I expected to die there. I expected to be, wow. to be carried out of there. Um, now, 
again, my role would have changed within it, but that was my community. That's where I'd poured my life into. In the foundations of the building that, of the building project I was just talking about before that we built the auditorium, I put my first ever Bible, my first Bible that I was ever given. So that was so precious to me. So I gave, you know, I, I poured, like, that represents, this is where I'm at. This is who I am, and I'm pouring myself into that place. Uh, and so when we were, uh, we left, and that, that came through, and again, really, it came through, there's no other way to say it except betrayal. And betrayal is where you have someone, you, you can't be betrayed by your enemies because you expect them to be enemies. You can only be betrayed by people that you trust and that you love. And so otherwise it's not betrayal. So mm. if you, I, I can deal with enemy attacks and things coming on. I was not ready for betrayal where you had people close to you that then suddenly you thought you knew but didn't and didn't know their agendas and, and perspectives. So that was really tough, dealing with that at such a cool thing uh, at a level. And so we found ourselves in a place where, not by our own choice, but we got a, somebody else saying, we don't think you should be here. And look, all these people now agree with me. You shouldn't be here. We can do a job better. So we then had to leave, and as you know, in the church setting, um, it's not just working in a church. You've got your family there. It's, your, it's all my, it's my friends. My friends were the people I worked with. And then suddenly all my... To my friends going, you know what? No, I was wrong. When, when you, and when you've got somebody really close to you and you've like a son in the ministry that you've raised up and you've given opportunity to a trainer and they said, I've been deceived by you. And you just like, and that, be, that because somebody else had, had got around them and pulled their heart and said, see, they've deceived you. To hear that was just like a knife in your heart. And so they're the things that when you leave, you're not, not just leaving a job, you'll leave... It's those sorts of things that are the heartbreak. And it's the people's lives as a pastor. You're not just there to, well, I'm here at job, I do a bit of pastoring. You make a covenant with people. And so you're covenant to pour your life out for them. You pray for them. You weep them. You're there for them in their hard times. You rejoice with them and they're rejoicing. You encourage you to do life with people. And then you say, now I'm being torn apart from that. Um, that was really, really tough. And so a couple of things that helped us get through it, I suppose, well, any. any Again, to add to the story, so we find ourselves in a place where, okay, we're not there, we're no, we're no longer in you know, community, no longer a job. But then also in that next 12 months, um, I go and look for jobs in the States. I've set up a job in, in America. Um, uh, I've, 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 uh, I've gone over it twice. I've done a job interview. I've got the immigration lawyer. And then my wife has a brain tumour, which means that we can't now go overseas because of the, 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 the healthcare situation. Um, we're here. And so that just gets done. And then at the same time, we've got health things. She previously just had a, a frozen shoulder. In that time, I also have two frozen shoulders as well, which is incredible pain. So all of these things going on. And so you're just thinking, wow, it was just like everything from every sort of direction, health and relationships and job and finance and and, and, and who am I now? Like, what, what, like, like I knew who I was, but what am I supposed to do? Like, like what does this look like? And as much as I had those core things that I knew that God had called me to, what? Because there was no plan B. There was no plan B. So in that time, things that really did was knowing that why, knowing that, that God um, had a plan for my life, that God loved me, and that he would see me through. That, that knowing that beyond the shadow of the doubt is one thing. And if, and if there's only one other thing that I would say that added to my, that helped a, 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 a practice, that really got us through, and that I built into my life years ago, and that was a practice of thanksgiving and gratitude. Um, so choosing to give thanks yeah. as an activity, not because I felt like it, but because it's the right thing to do. So choosing, and I, I've trained myself, and we've trained my, my wife is like that, and we've trained our kids like this. We've trained our kids to be thanksgiving because our heart as a family is that we want our kids to hate the local church and hate God. I was 17, 15, and 7 at the time. And we didn't want them to have that pastor's kids thing of, oh, look at the church of my family. We hate the church. How did they do that to mum and dad? And whatever else. We did not want that because we love God and we love the local church. We had a bad experience, but we love God's plan. So our heart was God, help us in this time to be able to see that come through. And, 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 and so we would give thanks to God and we'd show our kids, come on, let's give God thanks for what he is doing. How good was that? And when we'd be blessed with something and someone would bless us financially or someone would come through and go, look at this and we'd share it with our 
family are ending, we go, come on, let's thank God right now. God, thank you so much for the way that person, look at the way that person rang us up or encouraged us today or did this yeah. for us or did that. And, and that, that attitude of gratitude, it sounds so trite and it sounds can sound, and yet I credit that with being if not a main practice. That plus knowing my why and then choosing to give thanks was what got us through as a family. Yeah. And so now oh. I'm happy to report my kids are in church. They love God. They're serving God. They live in a different church. They're all doing great. And it's not because we're brilliant, but it's because we've got these things in place, which the Bible says to do, which actually really, really work. Yeah, and you've trained your children to have their own, you, that, that transference of them having their own walk with God, knowing who God is for themselves that God is not a reflection of the grown-up Christians around them because those yeah. grown-up Christians are only human and, and they, they make mistakes as well. Uh, you and I both have um, had experience with betrayal. You know, me, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I had the big one with going to prison, but there's been other ones where, you know, the flow on from that is also where people turn against you or... Uh, finding out that you really can't be a people pleaser and that that sometimes means um, saying, look, you know, no, uh, my family won't be involved in what your vision is there. We, we're called somewhere else or, or doing something like, you know, with people don't always appreciate. We were talking before about the changes and the tearing that it's very rarely smooth and everybody's happy all round. Sometimes things, you know, humans being what they are and having their different perspectives, they change. Now, one of the things that um, I, I would like to ask you, which I hadn't pre-warned you, <laughs> but you're pretty good with this stuff because you've got me thinking about this, that um, Thanksgiving is a key which stops us getting resentful. Uh, forgiveness... Being able to forgive, uh, I, I always get a bit edgy when preachers start bringing up that you've got to forgive because they very rarely tell you how. They just say that you have to do it, which can often put people in more bondage than what they were before because they want to but they don't know how or they don't know what it is. So can you give us a little insight in how that, was it a repetitive thing or was it a... Oh. You know, was it still is? It still is. To see from the other person's point of view, mm. but usually these yeah. people believe that they're right. They actually yeah, absolutely really believe that what they're doing is good and that you're in the wrong, and that can be quite <sighs> frustrating. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, to say the least. Look, forgiveness when it comes to that is is a couple of things. Um, forgiveness is not forgetting. Some people say you know, forgive and forget. You, to forget is to say that it like it never happened, but it, it did happen. So it's not about forgetting. It's it's choosing not to hold something against because forgiveness essentially is a monetary term. So someone incurs a debt against you and you choose to say you don't have to pay the debt. So the way I see it is that it's not saying, oh, you know, they didn't really mean it. it was like, no, a debt was, in, a debt was incurred against you. A debt has come against me that is owed, but I choose to say you don't need to pay anything. Mm. You don't need to pay back. And here's the thing, you don't even need to say I'm sorry because if someone needs to say I'm sorry to you, you're saying that you haven't fully paid the debt. I'll forgive the debt if you say will you forgive me. So, so forgiveness is not asking or expecting anything of anyone, all right? So forgiveness is not forgetting, but neither is forgiveness about um, uh, it's, not a, it's not a feeling. The other thing is it's not a feeling. So it's not like, oh, I'm feeling really forgiving today. It's like it's a choice. I choose to forgive, and I still choose to forgive. So when I find my mind going to that place, of, how did that happen? Why would they have done that? I'm able to, but the Bible says to capture those imaginations, to that thought and go, well, God, now I bless them. I pray for them. I pray for their family. And what I do is I bless them. The Bible says, yeah. bless those who curse you. So I just bless them. So I choose to pr pray for them, not because I'm feeling like, oh, I just got this beautiful loving feelings toward them. It's at that stage, I don't. I'm actually thinking the exact opposite, but I'm making a choice. So forgiveness isn't a feeling. It's about, Lord, I choose to bless them today and I release them today and I bless them. The other thing is forgiveness is 
um, not friendship. So just because I've forgiven you doesn't mean you're going to be my friend. So uh, that doesn't mean relationship has to be rebuilt. Now, it'd be nice to, but especially if the other party hasn't owned their part of it, look, they don't, they don't have to come and ask for forgiveness from you. That, the, the forgiving part of it has nothing to do with them. It's all to do with me. Because forgiveness is all about me, nothing to do with them. Christ has forgiven me, so yeah. I forgive them totally. But if they want friendship again, that's totally different. Right. If they want relationship, that doesn't mean I'm going to be their friend again because they haven't proven by their actions that they're worthy of reconnecting with or trusting again. So especially for people in abuse situations or betrayal, you can you, you need to forgive them. The Bible does not give you a choice about forgiving. You must forgive the person who abused you. But that doesn't mean you stay in a place where they continue to abuse you. It does not mean that at all. The Bible is not saying that, and neither should you. Uh, and so that doesn't mean I'm going to be back to have a relationship with these people again. And it could happen in the future. A whole bunch of things would have to happen for that. Day. Right. And so that doesn't mean I'm, yeah. Yeah, so but forgiving them, it doesn't mean that you need to tell them you forgive them because that could actually aggravate them and, and flare things up. Or do we need to let them know? I just want you to know I forgive you, or is it a is it a depends? Yeah, I think it's a depends thing. Um, some people use that, and it can be like someone's done something that they don't know, secretly hurt them, and go, "By the way, I've forgiven you." And you go, "Why? What did I do?" You know, and it can actually can be used as a bit of a manipulative thing yeah, by some attack. people to say, "Oh, I'm just letting you know, I'm just coming to tell you, <laughs> I've forgiven you." Yeah. For what? And I've had people come and tell me, "I've forgiven you for the way you preached that sermon the other week, and you said that." I'm like. <laughs> okay, you know, um, rather than having a conversation about the why and whatever else. So, so do you have to tell them? Yeah, maybe if you if, if, again, it just depends on. It's, that's a hard one. You know what I mean? Because yeah. sometimes it's the right thing to do. Sometimes it's not. The main thing is that you do do it, and then your actions will show that you do. Because if yeah. you've done that, then your actions, the way you treat them, will show that you do. Yeah, and then owning if there's been any part on your part that's that's added to it, then you can you can um, apologise to them as well. That's a different context. Yeah, so so yeah. I think there's there's a bit of discernment needed there because you, you mm, can make absolutely. things worse. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. That, that's something that mm. is is really really important um, for people and and that getting to that place of forgiveness. Yes, we do it by faith. We do it out of obedience, but it's really important to me. To, to have the mechanics of it because people's understanding of what it, what it means and what it does is, is different because, yeah. as you've explained, it doesn't mean what you did was okay and that we can pick up where we left off because we need to have boundaries in place. We need to have enough self-respect for the mm. child of God that we are. We are you know, if, if, if you were your best friend and you were looking out for your best friend, you would not put them back in a situation where, where you, are, you are putting yourself in a position where that other person is going to sin against them again. Mm. You know, so you're, yeah. Mm. So. Yeah, no, and I think that the mechanics basically are you have to, so you choose to, and you do it. And every time you think of them, you do it again. And you'll yeah. find that closer to the time, you're doing it lots, you're praying for them lots, and then you get to a point where you go, I'm praying for them more than I'm praying for my family. And I just yeah. get, and I, and basically I go because I, I believe in doing what the Bible says to do because it's the right thing to do because there's a reason for it. So every time I get upset by them in my mind, I pray for them. I stop there and I've trained myself to do that. And, 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 I, and like I said, yeah. I find myself praying for them more than I'm praying for my family. And I think, why are they getting more prayer than my family? You need to get over this. Um, uh, and so that helps me. So to, to not just not think about them, but uh, I find that there's a, Shoot the inside where I go, oh, for goodness sake. And the other thing is, unforgiveness locates you in your past. And I find that God is in the now. God is in the presence. His presence is in the present. Yeah. And so unforgiveness locates you in a place where God isn't. It locates you back, whereas God is here right now. Sufficient is today, right? right. He's here. He's the I am. He's in this ever-present moment. And so we're the ones that pull ourselves out of that by unforgiveness, by pulling ourselves back into the past. So we, we, we stay present to who God is now by being in the present and then releasing that past. Well, that's right. And uh, interesting thing you say about when, 
when you're constantly praying for that person, you're not really doing it to pray for that person. It's because you are allowing them to occupy real estate in your head. And that's why you turn it into prayer. But you, but it's still a way of your mind obsessing over them, mm. doing it yep. too much. Yep. And uh, so that's what I've found is to speak blessing over them and everything that, that I can think of, but not dwell. Yep. Um, yeah. And, and the, um, the beauty of the spoken word in thankfulness and in blessing is that it drains the toxin out mm. and, it, and it allows those, once again, the neural pathways to be remade and, re and repaired and refreshed. And then we can speak to the future. So, you know, it wasn't that long ago that the Lord spoke to me about uh, an, an ending of, of, of um, I just needed to put some boundaries around my life with, with certain, you know, types of people that... Um, I just realised we're not we're not good for me or for my family, and uh, and and the Lord said to me, He said, "It's you know, don't worry about that for now. Focus on your future and on Jesus, because that's what I'm building, and that's why I'm doing these programs. It's part of you know, as we come out of COVID, there's a future of of ministry and and people what people need." Uh, from me and from the guests that I bring on, people like yourself in, in your um, what your next part of life is that we're going to talk about with the Alpha courses that are doing some amazing things. And when you speak of the future and, and what's going to happen, what God's doing, there's a freshness, there's a breath, there's a life that's that's magic. When you're stuck in that past, it's like, oh, it's like a, a mess that's got to be cleaned up. Well, you know what? No, we let God deal with that focus on the future and somehow these things work out where we stop interfering with them <laughs> you know, just leave it. it leave it stop picking at that scab that's it and and move forward that's it so give it over stuff. to the lord absolutely so tell us uh, and, but the other, when you do it well like when you keep your attitude right you open up room for the blessing of the next opportunity to come it mm. won't come while you're still stuck. So you've moved into your next stage. And that's what I'd love to hear about with the alpha courses that you're running. That, that yeah, you're absolutely. So I now have a role there with alpha, um, naturally. So alpha is, a, it came out of England back in the 90s. Uh, and now is pretty much in most countries of the world. And really, it's a, it's a place where people come around and have a conversation about life, faith and meaning. So from a Christian perspective, and it's wonderful because I get to work in the church world. I get to work with pastors from all denominations, and not just pastors, but leaders and people from all over. And it's really where people can come. And basically what an alpha is, is that you, it's, it goes for about 10 weeks, 11 weeks, and then you, you invite people to come together, especially those who are maybe far from faith, maybe those who are maybe new Christians. Anyone can come, but it's really for, for those especially who are who are you know, away from God or have not had a relationship with God. That's its main aim. Uh, you, you bring them together. You, you you hang out together. You have some time. You create community. Let them know that we love you. We're going to love you no matter what goes on. You watch a video and then which, which presents an aspect of the Christian faith and then you have a conversation. And it's not about us trying to make people believe something, but it's like, now, we share what we think. What do you think? And then respecting people and allowing them to come up to anything and everything say anything they want and have a conversation now about God and allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do in those conversations and then allow that. And then so that's why it goes over a number of weeks so that people have got a chance to, to create that, that relationship together, to, to come uh, you know, and, and, and trust one another, feel confident enough to bring up those innermost things and then just go, well, this is what I think. And, and know that everyone in that group is going to respect you and honour you. They may not agree with you, but... They will respect you and honour you and your right to hold your opinion and just see what God does. And what we find is that uh, God changes so many lives and so many people come to faith in that time. Or if not, to faith, one of the mates that I had online was an unbeliever. He was still not calling himself a Christian. But I would say he's a lot closer now to that place of, of coming to faith than he was, you know, before we started Alpha uh, because we've had those conversations. It's so good. So it's, it's removing the barriers so that people can be open-minded. And I love that it's around conversation of what do you think? What do you think? When we often think of church as someone at the front telling us, well, what to think. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, I hate that phrase, yeah. but, but they say, well, the Bible says this, therefore that. And, but to have a conversation, the Bible is nuanced and so is faith. 
And, uh, mm. and when we are complex people, we come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different interpretations of things and different filters. And so when we can let that, those defences down, we can actually consider another point of view and someone else's point of view and go, huh, well, how does that work? And just, you know, if we had all the answers as an A, B, C, one, two, three, it wouldn't be God. That would be yeah, too, too shallow. These things are complex. And so... Um, having that freedom to explore and enjoy God and find out what he's like mm. that in, in a, in a free way is, is just brilliant. Mm. And, uh, and I, when I was chatting with you earlier about this, it's not just about, about uh, the basics of, well, it depends on what you call the basics, you know, with the, the, the becoming a Christian experience and baptism and so on. But I was really pleased and surprised that it included Holy Spirit uh, with those gifts of Holy Spirit. So where do you see um, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in church life today? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit hasn't changed, Jesus hasn't changed, and that uh, all the gifts are available. And the thing is, though, the Bible says that there's one spirit, but there's many different administrations or ministries. And so you can have the one gift of, let's say, let's pick one, prophecy. But it can look different in a different each church. It could look different in each person that, that, that does prophetic. And, you know, for some, it might be somebody at the front saying, this is what God is saying. Someone else, they could just be chatting with somebody over coffee and go, you know, really what? I really feel like this, that God's going to do this for you. Or you can have someone in a business sense go, you know what, we need a big business strategy and then, you know, bringing somebody in and going, I feel like God's going to do this in your business. And so the prophetic can outwork in many different contexts and it looks different and it sounds different, but essentially it's the same spirit just manifesting that differently. And so uh, I think what we do, especially with Alpha, is that we say that God... Holy Spirit wants to fill you. We know that. What that looks like is going to look different in every person. So in Alpha, we say, look, it could look a bit like this or this or this or this, yeah. but ultimately it doesn't matter what it looks like. The fact is that you've reached out and you've asked the Holy Spirit to fill you. Right. So that's the most important thing. So and the same thing in the to church today. Of. No, no. Yeah. And I'm glad. I, mean, I wish I had Alpha because when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I had a really quite significant experience that no one could explain to me. Wow. And so I went a little bit off at, at one stage because I was in a very traditional church that they I'd been saved um, uh, about six, seven weeks. It was it was um, Pentecost Sunday, and I got saved around Easter time somewhere. Uh, and then I, they they did they spoke on Pentecost, you know, they did the reading, and then the, they did the Acts two reading. And then one of the elders said, as he's reading it, and you can be still be filled today. He was one of those secret um, oh. charismatics in the church, and that's all he said. He said, if you ask God, he will still fill you today. And that's all he said, right? So I go home. I'm by myself. I went, well, that guy said I can be filled with the spirit. I don't know what that is, but God, would you fill me with your spirit? Would you fill me with your spirit? So I'm in my bedroom. I'm saying, God, fill me, fill me. All of a sudden, I feel like this presence coming into the room of just like a, like, like a physical presence. And then all of a sudden, out of my mouth, I start making these sounds and noises that were not coming from my head. I thought I'd gone insane because isn't that the definition <laughs> of insanity? The, I'm babbling things. It felt good. It felt right, but it was bypassing my brain. And I thought, what is that except insanity? But it was awesome insanity. Uh, I'm having this experience. I'm, I'm, I'm like this. I then when when this sort of thing lifted, I raced to the phone and got on the phone and went rang my friend and said, "What just happened to me?" He goes, "You're speaking in tongues." I said, "What speaking in tongues?" I never heard speaking in tongues before. Now, we just heard it read to us in Acts 2, but I never experienced it. I didn't know what that meant today. I had no clue. He was just reading me something from the Bible, and yet it happened to me, and yet then I had to try and work out and figure out because no one in the church knew how to disciple me then because I was like they weren't expecting that. Whereas if I had something like Alpha where it basically says, this is what the Bible says, this is what can happen, doesn't have to, but it can happen. So this is just what God does. And then he can do it this or this or this, all sorts of things. Now let's do it. And it's done in such a beautiful way. Uh, and so that it was like, oh, that would have helped me so much. Oh. <laughs> and again, it's still happening like that. And even online. I just heard the other day of a, of a guy online, someone was saying the story, they did about prayer, about the Holy Spirit. And the girl said, look, I hadn't even got to the part to explain what we're going to do next. 
all of a sudden he starts speaking in tongues and she goes, I muted him because he's still going, but she's trying to have a conversation. And then he's jumping like this because the prince of God's on him. He's, so she goes, I had to turn his video off, not because she wanted to stop him, but because <laughs> everyone else is being distracted going, what, what, what's going on? Um, so it still happens today, but it, that was happening in Alpha. And so that she was then able to give context to everybody and be able to talk people through it. And he knew what was, he could get conversation around what was going on and not feel weird or strange because of oh, what was awesome. happening. So, yeah, so that's, what, that's why I love Alpha. That's one oh, of the reasons I love Alpha. And, you know, it's Alpha is such a great course because it, it's, that's one part of what it covers, but it, but it covers like a well-rounded areas mm. like the topics that you do cover and it's probably mm. something that that would be good for everybody to do because there's bound to be some gaps in uh, yeah. depending on what denomination we've belonged to we've emphasized different parts so mm. what a great thing so if uh, if you have an interest in finding out more then i would recommend you go to the website which is alpha a l p h a as in the greek letter alpha dot org dot au and uh, have a little poke around there and an explore and just be open-minded and, and see uh, whether that's that's a course that uh, would some, well, it will add value to your life, but whether it's it's something that, that you've got an appetite for right now. I hope that we've piqued your interest. It's been a great conversation with Pastor Paul Skip Smith and uh, we've, we've covered um, some really significant territory with the, the tough stuff that builds resilient faith. So thank you for joining us, everybody. Please like, comment and share. Or um, if it's on the podcast, please rate us well so that uh, the, the podcast gets known. We will have more guests with some interesting things. And um, also, if you've got any questions that you wish that I had asked or that you'd like to know about, please let me know and I'll, and I'll take them on board for as I move forward with, with people that, that come on because it's nice to get the behind the scenes conversation and not just the preach. Because it's just been really valuable. Thank you so much, Pastor Paul. No worries. Thanks so much, Trish. Pleasure being on the show with you today.